Welcome back everyone. As you may know, we have three very important designers on the team that are absolutely instrumental in our ability to rebuild Hawker Typhoon JP843 here in the shop. Without these guys, I don't know what I'd be doing. Martin Oldfield, Nicholas Walter, and my father Bruce Slater are all instrumental in our ability to take the information that we have to work with, which can some, quite often be very limited, and convert it into usable models that are accurate to the true design intent of the aircraft. In Episode four, we're going to split it into a two-part series, and I've caught up with Martin Oldfield and Bruce Slater and had a discussion on uh, the origins of some of these drawings and how they were originally done, as well as how we work with them and produce CAD files today. You apprenticed at Armstrong Whitworth. Armstrong Whitworth, yeah, which was a very, very old company. Um, they eventually closed, I'm trying to remember, it was early 60s. Pretty much all the plants in, in England were closing down in those days. And they all came under the umbrella of Hawker Siddeley at that time, which eventually became British Aerospace. Mm -hmm. So with your apprenticeship, what were you apprenticing as? Was that a design engineer? As, a, as an aeronautical engineer. Um, so we actually spent uh, three years in the shops working various uh, machines, stretch press machines, which we talked about earlier. I'm going to uh, give my secret away. <laughs> it's a secret project. All my projects are secret. <laughs> Oops, sorry. You're going to have to edit that out. Uh, so we worked through all the shops, detail manufacturing, sub-assemblies, final assembly, worked the flight shed, flight line, a little bit of test flight, uh, worked in the test labs, which was fascinating, especially the, I uh, worked in the sonic test lab for a while and we actually destroyed pieces of structure with sound, it was quite impressive. Um, so that was a five-year apprenticeship. Uh, we spent the last two years of it going through various engineering offices until we decided um, what career path to take. I didn't get involved in any you know, CAD stuff until I was in Israel. And we, and that time we were using a program called CADAM. In what year would that be? That was 84. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> pretty pretty yeah. early still. It's still fairly early in, in the scheme of things, but it was on, in those days it was only a 2D package. Okay. Um, by the time I left their 86, they'd had their first trial runs on a 3D package, which was very basic. Yeah. Um, not very productive. The design of the Typhoon, from your experience at that time, how would they have gone and um, done their prototyping and then drawing phase of it? I'm not sure what they did on prototyping. Um, in my days, uh, we had what we call wood mock-ups. Okay. Um, they were basically only for space allocation, you know, to oh. work where you put the equipment and what, what have you. They, they, they were just wooden mock-ups. They weren't being used to verify any of the structure. Okay. So all, all the drawings were created by hand. And so some of the drawings were, you know, you got little bumps and lumps in them. Um, which would happen normally when you think that you're using a pencil that's got 20 thou point on it, yeah. <laughs> which you're having to sharpen every time you use the damn thing, using set squares, 30 degree, 45 degree set squares. Yeah. Uh, you, you use a protractor to sort your angles out. Right? On, uh, on small boards, we use what we call a T-square, which will give you a parallel line up and down the drawing. You've got to give it to those guys. They, they were especially skilled, especially the lofters. Yeah. Um, the loft lines that were drawn for the, the main major profiles of the airplane were all done out in huge loft tables. Okay, full and scale. Full scale, yeah. large spines, yeah. and ele uh, weights that we called elephants. <laughs> because they had a little trunk tang on that held the spline down. This, and I'll, I'll put a picture in there. This is a discussion that Martin and I had the other day because <laughs> when I was researching it, there's two schools of thought that I read about, and one was uh, the air side for 
um, aircraft lofting, they called them ducks. But for the naval side, for doing shipbuilding, they called them uh, fish. I thought it was whales, wasn't it? No, uh, I heard fish. I okay. heard whales yeah. from you and elephants from you. So yeah, I'll yeah. <laughs> lofting weights is what they actually are. Yeah. Right? So that they would draw out the main profiles, and then they would go out to the tool shop, and the the modelers would build these full size plaster models. Okay. So any of the small errors that would be in the drafting would get uh, cleaned out when they wiped the plaster into them, so it okay. all got smoothed out. Yeah. Right. Um, the next stage would be getting into the master tooling. Okay. So e even though your drawings might be plus or minus 10 thou if you're lucky, um, w when you've got a hinge pin it needs to go into the hole, it can't be 10 thou off. <laughs> right. yeah. So the creative masters uh, which which control things like hinge pins for control surfaces, uh, landing gear pickups, winter fuse lad pickups. Okay. So all those were controlled by a master tool, which was went gone into the assembly tool to build the fixture that would actually build the component. Okay. So you knew that you build this assembly over in, in the sub assembly shop, you bring it into the major assembly, you know it's going to fit. And yeah. what about the production tooling? How did, did that come out of the, um, the models that they created as well? Yeah, you, your um, stretch form blocks for your skin panels came from the Plaster Masters. Okay. Um, so the, the internal structure, like ribs, um, they were done on, on full size uh, drawings, which got photographed onto a sheet of metal. And, and then the parts were cut from the metal, according the to the profile, pattern. all the flat patterns, yeah. Nice. Yeah. So the, 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 the real scale came in when you finally got all these bits and putting them together. Uh, you, you got guys that we used to call assembly fitters. Yeah. And these guys would do the shimming and the tweaking to make sure that everything worked. Right? And there must have been a substantial amount of that. That's Lots of shimming, things. yeah. But it's all been done within certain tolerances. Okay. Yes. So, I mean, you, the masters, they try to build them to plus and minus five thou of the engineered position. Wow. Okay. <laughs> but they will be plus and minus five thou for the same pin and hole. Yeah. They would they will be in the same position. Yeah. They might be a little bit off of location from the drawing. But they'll yeah. function together. But they will function. Yeah. Yeah. What are the issues with working with some of the original drawings and data that we're using to recreate this uh, aircraft? Okay, well, it, as I say, the first thing was we don't have any original drawings as far as I know. We have a lot of microfish aperture cards, yes. thousands of them. Yeah. Okay, but they are just photographs of the actual drawings which were not necessarily taken very carefully. A lot of those drawings you'll see in, in the microfiche, you'll see little wrinkles in the sheet, yeah. so they weren't flat. Some of them, uh, what should be a round tube, is actually an oval tube. <laughs> <laughs> That's been a problem a couple of times now. Isn't yeah. It? yeah. So th they're fine for information, but th there's nothing like having a full-scale drawing that, which you can... Uh, cheat and you know, take dimensions off and scale and do all kinds of even the scale drawing you can you can, you can figure out where bits go and what sizes they are all, all the information is there yeah. and you know with, with a bit of digging here and there and um, you can get the full story of what the, what the component should look like so between the aperture cards between what pieces of structure we do have um, I know a, a lot of the wing structure you've had scanned, which is I haven't got into at all yet. <laughs> it's um, coming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So with with all those resources, you can, you can get pretty damn close to what the original airplane looked like. Yeah. Right. And then from there, once you've combined those resources, mm -hmm. I guess just simply having it built into CAD at that point gives you another resource because it's a known gap or a known measurement that's missing from it or a profile. That you, you, as I say, you can adjust the fit to yeah. uh, to match that. We've, we've had a few of those. In fact, there's, there's one here that we, that we discussed. I don't know if that shows up. Anyhow, this is the fitting off the wing. 
which attaches up into the fuse up into the fuse that it's picking. So here's your pickup point. The wing spar goes out this way. Right. So what? So what we do with these is, of course, we measure them and reverse engineer them and make a solid model of it. But I don't know if you can see it on the camera there. But if you look at this, can we get that shown? Yeah, bring it a little closer. Yeah. The holes are well off center line. Um, we, we believe that these were actually drilled on the assembly. So, but there's there's no way I'm, I'm going to let a design go by like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we need to do some more research on the wing joint for that particular point. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to head over to our YouTube channel and subscribe for uh, regular updates that we do here in the shop. And if you're able to, support the project by heading over to our paid subscription channel where you'll get a little bit extra information and you'll get to see everything happening a little bit sooner. Until then, take care guys. Cheers.